<clears throat> I'm amazed by these uh, by these slides, and I'm, I'm I have to really apologize because I wish I spent like hours and hours making the slides as big as this. Um, unfortunately, I don't have them as big as this because it's really there's a lot of visual information I'm going to be showing today. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk about, well, this is in pursuit of digital happiness. And, and, and usually I, I'd say what I'm presenting here is basically in pursuit of facts in what they say it's the post-truth era or the, the era of fake news and alternative facts. But rather than focusing all this negativity, I'd rather want to show you a very silent or small revolution that has been ongoing as well. Because there has been an enormous um, uh, amount of information that has become available to anyone with an internet connection. And that's changing a lot of information, that's changing a lot of um, fact-finding investigations. So I want to show you a little bit how we go about investigating, for example, the downing of a civilian airliner, investigating airstrikes and so on. But rather than focusing immediately on these really um, sometimes saddening investigations, because obviously you're investigating very um, um, difficult subjects, um, I think what is very important as well is that um, sometimes it's approaching very difficult questions as a puzzle. So for me, this started um, with a befriended journalist on Facebook, right? His name is Asing. He lives in the northern part of the Netherlands. And he would post pictures on Facebook asking, hey, rara waar ben ik? Or in English, guess where am I? So, well, I mean, I've been to this city, so I recognize the skyline. Does anybody know here, perhaps, where it would be? I'd, I'd, I'd be impressed if you'd know. Because the building in the middle with the very high antenna, that's the Palace of Science and Culture in, in Warsaw, uh, the capital of Poland. And I've been there many times because I was a student that was hitchhiking there and so on. So I recognized the skyline. And I knew Google Maps, Google Earth, they have those cities modeled in 3D, right? And I can just go there and uh, make sure that the... Um, I'm not sure whether it's... Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, you see on the... Uh, well, the original photo, we have a 3D image of Google. So I could set the skyline in the same um, perspective as I saw it on the photo. And then using the satellite image, I could determine his exact location where I was sitting. So I commented on his Facebook post. Well, he asked you, you asked where you are. You are in the Logos Hotel in Warsaw. And I guess around the fifth or sixth floor. So he replied, well, fourth floor. But there's a kind of floor in between. So I was kind of right. So this became a game, right? He was posting a picture. Guess where am I? Well, this is a simple one. I think everybody knows, right? Where is this? Regent Street, indeed, between Piccadilly Circus and uh, Oxford Street in London. Well, there is Google Street View in London, so I can put the yellow man of Google Street View just at the exact same position where he was standing. So it's by determining, sometimes you know where it is, sometimes it's more difficult, you have to look for visual clues like Signage or uh, uh, the water level, for example, here. And I could see this is in uh, Amsterdam, at the Java Kade. Sometimes there's so little visual information that you have to look for context. I mean, here, we, we don't have a big building, we don't have a skyline. So how on earth can I determine where this photo was taken? So I look at the post he posted before, it was in the northern part of the Netherlands, and the post after, which was in Amsterdam. Well, I, I, myself, I was born in, the, in, in Leeuwarden, in Friesland, so each time I need to go to the Randstad, as they say, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, I need to pass by um, Flevoland. And to be very honest with you, for the Dutch people in here, I mean, if you go by train from Almelo, of, what's the name? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Lelystad to Almere. This is like the most depressing area you will find in the Netherlands. So I looked at this picture and I think, okay, there's only one place that can look that sad, and that must be Flevoland. Um, so I just followed the train track, and I was looking for a river, and I was looking for, you see those trees, right? And you see the, uh, well, kind of sand patches and vegetation patches, and it was just trial and error. And I followed the train track on Google Maps, and I found the river, I've even found the trees. The red uh, uh, marks the similarities. So I could say where he was. Now, obviously, this is, this is a fun game to play. I also play it in WhatsApp group, family group. Maybe you have a family WhatsApp group with your children or with your uh, wife or, or husband. And my sister is a pilot, so sometimes she pict posts uh, pictures of the city, guess the city. Anyone knows? It's Netherlands? Yeah, I think it's going there, yeah, indeed. So this is really easy, right? Because I go from an aerial perspective, looking on Google Earth through an aerial perspective. Sometimes there's, again, there's very little, very little clues. There's my brother. This is Friday evening. He says, where am I? 
Well, I mean, he, he, I know he does sports on Friday. I know what he liked to eat on Friday. So I was, <laughs> I was going to um, make a wild guess, and I'm thinking he's either at KFC or at McDonald's, drive-in. And, I mean, the visual clues, I can confirm, actually, where he is, because we have the tiles, or, like, the, we have the road, we have the bushes, and if we compare this photo with what we see on Google Street View, we can even compare the bushes with each other and see these exact same things. We can even see the tiles are exactly the same, the two, two things on top of the uh, light green bush. So I could confirm. I said, well, where, where are you? I said, well, you're, you're probably getting a Big Mac at McDonald's. So this is basically a game which, which I'm playing um, with friends, with family. But, uh, well, here you can see Street View. I'm oh, sorry, it's a light perspective. So this is a game we're playing with friends and family, but you can also use this for more serious things. And um, I'd like to call this like digital open source investigation. Well, you see, if, 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 if other media writes about us, what we're doing, you can see they pretend we're sitting with a suit like this behind our laptops. Well, I'm not even standing with a suit now here on stage, so this is not really reality. Sometimes I'm sitting in my boxy short behind my laptop. It doesn't really matter. What well, the thing is, is that I can just use my laptop, can use it anywhere, make a hotspot with my mobile phone, have an internet connection, and start investigating, whether it is where my brother is having dinner, or, to give this example, um, uh, uh, for exa or what I was talking about, uh, for example, Islamic State supporters. So three years ago, a group was started called Bellingcat to bring those people together that are doing these digital open source investigations. So what we're using is open source information. So this is really, really powerful because we are basing our investigations on information that's openly to anyone with an internet connection. So anything I'm saying here, you don't have to believe me for my word. You can take the same steps and you can reproduce the investigation and come to, same, to the same conclusion. So we use like traditional media, but mostly also satellite imagery and of course social media as sources of information. To give you an example how much information there is available, I'm going to show you a very, well, non-relevant event to not nothing. But let's say, look, have a look at this Russian sailor man. He's standing on a military ship, and we're tracing and monitoring this ship and his social media profiles, because we're wondering, maybe he's posting a selfie where there's some helicopter in the background or some crates of weapons that are being shipped, for example, from Russia to Syria. So it's interesting for us to, to know what's going on on the ship. But there is so much open source information available that when he has his picture taken, there's someone looking at the shores, this is Istanbul, and filming the very same ship he is standing on. So I'm not quite sure if it's, it, it's not playing, it seems. Well, anyway, this is a video of the ship where it's playing. Yeah, I think it's, um, I saw the mouse just in the screen from the back. You can, you can press play so you can see if anyone can press play on the back. <laughs> if not, it doesn't really matter, we can, we can forget it, but yeah, you get the idea, right? There's somebody filming this same ship, but if we take a closer look at um, the video, we can see actually somebody standing on the ship, it's the exact same moment he has his picture taken. So this shows how much open source information there is available if you know where to look. Um, so that's what we're usually doing. A big event happens, let's say something happens here in Brussels, and we start collecting all that open source information to get a better perspective of what is going on. Um, here's another example. Um, well, this was a video again, but for some reason it's uh, not playing. It doesn't really matter, but what you would see here is a fight on a terrace. So the interesting thing was that people on my Facebook page were sharing it like, oh, these are uh, refugees fighting with each other and imposing Sharia law. You can see um, you, see, you can see a lot of people posting on Facebook what's going on. But I recognize the place, and it's unfortunate the video doesn't play, but I think everybody from the Netherlands knows this place, right? Where would it be? Groningen, indeed. Grote Markt. So there were even fellow students from mine in London saying, this is, this is in Germany, and, and so on. I'm like, well, listen, I, I'm from this place. I studied here five years. I know this is in Groningen. They told me, prove it. I'm like, sure. I go to Google Street View. Look at this house, the red house, and this house over here. Go to Google Street View in Groningen. How can you tell me this is not the same place? And then they told me, okay, well, then prove that it's not what we say it is. I say, sure, just Google. Now we know what the location is. Google, terrorist riot. And you can even see European headlines. They are football hooligans fighting with each other. So obviously, verifying information is very important. And remember that game, Guess Where Am I? I played it with family and friends, but you can also play it with, well, less friendly persons, like these um, 
IS uh, uh, militants. Now, the thing was here, these guys were uh, reportedly had killed Tunisian politicians. Now, they claimed to be in a propaganda video that they were in Raqqa, in the capital of um, uh, the so-called Islamic State at the time. While the Tunisian government said, well, we have, we are, they're on the surveillance, don't worry, we, we know where they are, they're in Tunisia. So who's speaking the truth here? And again, we are playing the, um, I, I really hope that the videos, yeah, now the videos play, so that's great. This is a part of the propaganda video they published. So as you can see, again, there's very little visual information to try to figure out where they are. But still, it's enough to figure out the exact location. What we need to do is look very carefully at the information. So if we replay, replay, we look carefully, and what do we see on the background? We do see a little bit of a skyline in the background. We see trees, we see um, the building. So here we have a little bit. We can see two windows, right, and a kind of a staircase or something like that, and then more windows and a bigger building in, in, in the background and uh, some trees, as it appears. So what we did is we just went to Raqqa, sorry, in uh, Syria, because they said they claimed we're in Raqqa, and we're looking for buildings that have two windows and those staircases, and we thought, okay, this, may be, this building may be a match. And we shift through historical imagery in Gulgurt because we want to have a photograph of where it actually shows the windows, like here. Because the satellite captures the buildings from different sides each time, right? So this is the side we're interested in. We can actually count two windows, staircase, um, stair or whatever, and more windows. So we have thought, okay, this is a match. And we could even go further uh, south of this building and figure out, okay, there's a larger building standing in front, which also matches what we saw in the background. So what we did now is basically draw a line of perspective. So we have this building. We put a, a dot on it, and we draw this line of perspective to the other building we saw, and then we just follow that line until we find a building which is high enough for people to stand up and to film, to see, okay, could this be the place where they're standing? So you can see it goes over a lot of low-rise buildings. Eventually, the line ends at this building. So we thought, okay, maybe they're standing there. Can we find more visual information? And yes, we can, because there is this very massive flagpole in the background. So we thought, okay, it must be somewhere around there. And if we actually um, go to the side of this building, and again, shift through historical imagery, you can actually see the massive shadow a flagpole cast there, and even the shadow of this massive flag. But there's even more. We also saw this building, and we saw in a different part of the video that there must be a building um, behind the flagpole. So if we here, we have a composite image of different stills of the video. We can see the flagpole in the middle, right? And we can see a building behind it with a red roof, rectangular windows, then some kind of triangular windows and more triangular windows. And we thought, okay, this, this may be that building because it's indeed behind the flagpole. But we couldn't do the trick with the historical imagery here because it's usually north-south, and this is east-west because we're interested in the western side of this building. There's no Google Street View here, so how do I get eyes on the ground? It's not that I can, can, can hitchhike to Raqqa now. So there is this kind of thing called uh, Panoramio, which are geotagged photos. These are, if I would take a picture of you guys right now, I would upload it to Panoramio with a geotag on, and then would go to this building in Google Maps, this picture would show up in the hotel. So this is basically the ID, and we were lucky because the picture was taken from besides this building. So we had eyes on the ground, and we could compare this building with what we saw in the background. And we can indeed see the red roof, we can indeed see the rectangular windows, and the uh, keyhole-shaped windows, the larger one and the smaller ones. And last but not least, we could even see the balustrade on the background for those guys that um, uh, matched with the building we thought they were standing on. So we could tell our Tunisian contact, like, well, I think the Tunisian government either has a problem or is lying or is not aware, uh, aware that these guys are actually in Syria and not in Tunisia, as claimed. So this shows how, um, with very little information, you can do stuff. And sometimes can even be funny. This was a campaign of ISIS supporters, including in Brussels, in Munich, in Amsterdam. And they wanted to do, they wanted to instill fear on us. They wanted to show, this is support for the Islamic State, but we, we are everywhere. Look, this is Deutschland, Münster. Um, but we can do the same trick again. While they wanted to instill fear on the general audience, we thought, well, we can figure out actually why you took these photos. So let's say, what would be the visual clue here? Anyone? The bus? But perhaps even the light? The, the, exactly, the advertisement. They, this, this person claims he or she that, she, uh, that, that 
This was taken in Deutschland, in Münster. How many Germans are here in the room? Do we have any Germans in the room? Yeah? You guys are, yeah, you guys, with all respect, it's, it's, it's great. You guys are so organized. <laughs> you even have websites that list all the advertisement polls in Germany. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's fantastic. And we know this is not, this is not a, a, a Groschflache or a superposer, but it's a Ganzsaule, because you even see the icon, right? It's this, this pillar, a column. So we just mark that one, and we go to uh, Münster, and we can see, okay, these, these are all the locations, they're, they're clustered, and we just start looking at all of them and see what could be a match with the photo we saw. And if we start comparing, we thought, okay, this may be the perspective. So first of all, this is the line, this is the perspective of the photographer, and then we start comparing what we see in the photo with the satellite image, right? So um, first of all, we have here the uh, fence, um, which is very similar. I mean, we see the fence in the background. We can see the, 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 the white lines on the, um, on the asphalt, and we can see the traffic lights, and we can also see the larger traffic lights. So it shows, I mean, we could geolocate where these ISO supporters were. And now you won't believe it, but some of them even took pictures out of their bedroom window. Well, that's not the best thing you want to do if you declare support for ISIS, and we can see from which bedroom window it was taken. So obviously this is very interesting. It's a very new way of investigating stuff. But a very, very um, big case in the Netherlands was the downing of MH17. This was an aircraft that departed from Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, was designed for Kuala Lumpur, but disappeared from the radar above eastern Ukraine, near the city of Donetsk. Almost uh, 300 people were on board, they all died, and uh, there were a lot of claims what happened to the aircraft. Um, just now, just I think uh, last Friday, I was at a uh, conference for investigative journalists in the Netherlands, and there was a journalist of Russia. And you won't believe it, but there are still people believing even that dead bodies were placed on board at Schiphol Airport, and this is all a very big cover-up. Remember the MH370 plane that disappeared somewhere in the ocean? Some people even believe that this is actually the same plane. I mean, there's a lot of conspiracy theories out here, and I think here we're in a room with a lot of people that are, well, we may all think rationally, but there is a lot of people believing these kind of conspiracy theories. Now, the thing is, it was, at the beginning, a little bit unclear. People were saying it was a fighter jet. People were saying it was a missile launcher. So what was going on? Who could we trust? So people online started looking at the online information we could find. So this was, became a very important picture, because what we see, one of the theories was that it was shut down by a missile launcher, namely a book missile launcher system. And this photo was allegedly in Eastern separatist-held Ukraine, taken right before the MH17 was shot down. And what do we see on this photo if we zoom in? We can see here a Bok missile launcher on a deep loader, on a truck. Now again, it's very important that we verify this location because it could, could have been taken anywhere in the world. So again, we need to look for visual clues. And here we look at the name of the shop called Stroydom. So this is a visual clue, we can just type it into Google. And we found there's someone holding a Wikipedia page or a wiki page of shops in this town in eastern Ukraine, Torres. So now we have Magazine Stroydom. We can see there is actually a shop with that name. We start looking further and we find a court document. It's from 2010, so it's not relevant for us what the content is, because it was like some fight, drunk fight in the shop or whatsoever. But what is relevant is that there's an address listed at the shop. We can just type in the address into Google. And we fly to the location. And now we can do the same. We can try to find matching elements of what we see here and with a photo. And we could confirm this is indeed the same location. You may have seen funny Russian dashcam videos. Well, Russians like to drive around, or uh, the whole form of Soviet Union likes to drive around with their dashcam on and put it online, even if there's nothing funny happening. But this is, again, very good situational awareness of a location. So we could confirm actually here on the, on the right, we can see the yellow signature of the shop, and on the left we could see the apartment building in the block. So we could tell local journalists and international journalists, this is where the book was. So people filmed that location and we could indeed see it's the exact same location. Now what was also interesting, now we had a location where a book missile launcher was spotted. But could we also figure out a time of the day? Now as you know, for the, the one of the oldest methods to get a perception of time is looking at, 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 at the shadows, right? The sundial. You put a stick inside, let's say, the desert ground, and the shadow changes along the day changes, right? So nowadays, we can just go to a website called Suncork, and we can actually calculate the direction of shadows and get an impression of between which hours it was taken. 
So now we had a time, we had a place, and this was just one, this is one example of all the multimedia information that was available related to this military convoy. Um, here, for example, we have a video taken from an apartment building uh, showing the same convoy. So these were all puzzle pieces for us. Oh, sorry, these were all puzzle pieces for us, and we were able to map how this missile launcher was traveling before MH17 was shot down through separatist eastern Ukraine, went to the site very close to where MH17 was shot down, and a day later traveled back to the Russian border, missing one missile. But at the same time, this information war is going on. So we have the Russian Ministry of Defense here publishing satellite imagery. They say this is 14th of July, um, and uh, this shows a Ukrainian military base. That's what the Russian Ministry of Defense says. They said, we also have a satellite image of the 17th of July, the day that MS-17 was shot down. And I said, why is this interesting? Because they say on the 14th, they have a book standing in their military base. On the 17th, it's gone. Now, they weren't saying Ukraine shot it down, but they were strongly implying they did. But we, want to, we, we don't care who is right or wrong. We only want to care what are the facts. Can we fact check those satellite images? Well, you can't imagine 10 years ago that you would do this as a journalist or anyone with a computer connection, but because there's so much satellite imagery available, we can actually fact check it. So this is nothing else than what I did as a kid. Um, guess the differences, not guess the, but how do you call it, verschillen in English? Spot the differences, indeed. Right, you have a table of a cartoon, and on the one there's a bottle of water, and the other one is missing, and then you circle, oh, this is different. It's the exact same thing we do here. Look at these kind of patch of trees here. Well. If we look at open source imagery from the 17th of July, we can see there are no trees standing here. Okay, that's possible, right? It can be in three days' time, they cut down all those trees. But if we look at all open source imagery, we can see that on the 2nd of July, the 17th of July, and 21st of July, there were never no trees there. So how on earth is it possible that the Russian Ministry of Defense has a satellite imagery of the exact same location suddenly showing trees? <laughs> Actually, we can go back in time and see that this from not even weeks, but months, perhaps even years ago, that this picture was taken. This box that they were showing in this picture was inoperable for years and has been, hadn't been standing there. So you have to imagine, this is four days after MH17 was shot down, they present misdated evidence. So that only created more interest with our collective to figure out where this book was coming from. But we had one problem. Look at this video, this is in, in Russia. Look how many anti-aircraft missile launches are being transported here. How could we be sure we're tracing the right vehicle? How could we be sure that the vehicle we were tracing was indeed not a Ukrainian uh, uh, one? Maybe it was. So my colleague came up with a genius idea, and that's looking for unique characteristics of all those vehicles. So we call this the side skirts fingerprint, because what happens above the wheels, there is a plastic kind of uh, side skirt, uh, thick rubber, and it's, um, it damages along the way the vehicle is being used. So we built this massive database of geolocated anti-aircraft book missile launches. And we started comparing the side skirts with each other. And in that way, we were able to basically digitally trace the footsteps of one, the missile that we saw in eastern Ukraine. And that way, we could trace it back in Russian territory. You can see how it goes back day by day. And um, the, it, it ended, the digital footsteps ended at a city called Kursk. So we thought maybe there's an anti-aircraft brigade there. So you Google it, you see, hey, it exists, Wikipedia page. Um, they have social media pages. If you look who is posting on that social media page, um, they're very kind to post an attendancy list on <laughs> social media. So we have names, we fill those names in, we can find their profiles. Now obviously these are food soldiers, right? Okay, we can laugh about it, obviously, but this, this could be my brother or it could be my friend, you know what I mean? These are food soldiers, they're just following all this. But nevertheless, it's open source information, and 300 people died, so it's important to use this information to figure out what, ha what the hell happened. They also posted pictures of the military convoys traveling, so we had more information to geolocate, to verify the time, and so on, and to map it. And sometimes they would even stand in front of the places they were traveling through, so we didn't even have to geolocate it. This is very close to the Ukrainian border. And this way, we were able to figure out basically how the murder weapon traveled from a military base in Russia, crossed the border into Ukraine, shot down MH17, and a day later traveled back with one missile missing. This is what open source information can reveal. We were able to identify the commander of the unit, but not only that, we could also identify the people responsible for this specific bug unit. Now, we are not sure whether these people were actually inside the vehicle when somebody pressed the button to shoot down the aircraft, 
But nevertheless, we, we can only think these people must know what happened to their vehicle because they're responsible for it. Now, this all kind of information is obviously very interesting for a journalistic investigation, but we also didn't want to endanger the criminal investigation that's going on. So we shared all this information, not blurred and so on, with the joint investigative team led by the Dutch police. And they've also said publicly that this has been very useful information for them. And they initially weren't aware of everything they could find online. Now that having said, um, I hope to have, uh, I could talk for ages about different case studies as well. Um, I've shown you now a case example of Russia, but we, belling the cat stems from the Engl uh, English idiom, belling the cat, in, the, in, the, in Dutch, the cat and bell aanbinden. And we don't really, care about who the cat is we're investigating. We have investigated the Pentagon. We have investigated, as you saw, the Russian Minister of Defense. We investigate anyone. And that I'm just showing now, MH17 is time-wise, but um, I hope I've given you a good impression of what I think is a very promising um, um, yeah, view for the, for the future if more people start investigating all kinds of stuff. Many thanks for your attention. So, so, so you're doing extremely important work. I think you realize that, right? Um, so how are the existing institutions embracing this? So you've already said that you've shared this information mm -hmm. with the uh, investigative team. Mm -hmm. Do they embrace this or do they see it as a threat or do they take, do they take you seriously? Or, or I think in the What's beginning, the yeah. I think in the beginning they weren't necessarily taking us seriously, but later on they definitely did. I mean, um, like that we provided the information is simply because we think we, we don't want to ruin the official investigation, right? But of course, as a journalist, you want to keep independence, and not everyone at Bellingcat is a journalist. But if you talk about the um, about the institutions, I think there's kind of two strands. One strand is like oh, digital information we can't verify, we shouldn't do anything with it. And there is another strand that says, okay, the power of the crowd, um, all that information you can find online in open sources is actually very useful. And we have seen actually, to, to mention two examples, we have seen Europol using this. So Europol is, 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 is obviously the European police forces working together. And there was a very big case, a child pornography case, and uh, they were looking for objects shown in this material to see if it could lead to those persons. Um, eh, Robert M. In, in Amsterdam was actually found because they figured out who bought a Nintje shirt. So basically they had the same idea. They couldn't find the tree, they couldn't find the location, they couldn't find the tiles, they couldn't find... But they knew, okay, the power of the crowd, it has it. So the Europol campaign has been very successful in identifying dozens and dozens of objects, which hopefully leads to the perpetrators of this material. Mm -hmm. The same we can see with the International Criminal Court. On the 15th of August, in the first time of his history, the ICC in The Hague um, has issued an arrest warrant for a, a Libyan commander, in this case, Verfali, Mahmoud Verfali, um, solely based on social media videos. Videos posted on YouTube and Facebook showing executions for which he was responsible or for which he committed. So I think if you have an international criminal court basing an arrest warrant solely on open source information, I think this, this is indeed changing um, uh, the reality. Uh, well, it's aligning an international criminal court with the realities of today, and that's that many um, crimes are actually recorded, or whether it's direct evidence or with MH17 circumstantial evidence. So how is this financed, this Bellingcat? We all started as volunteers, and uh, right now still the biggest part of the team is a volunteer. Um, um, but we have, uh, we have crowdfunded uh, the core costs, and we apply for funding. For example, uh, uh, Google's digital news initiatives. So we're really free to do whatever we want with that kind of money, so that's great. And on the other hand, we're all freelancers, so we we, we speak, we give workshops at, for example, media organizations and so on to, uh, to make a living, yeah. So please continue this important work. Thank, Thank you, you, Christian. Thank you.